And he entered on to the other bodies. Yes, Tom? Yes, the bulls is well on the back side um, the yeah, times. And on the 29th, we'll be celebrating uh, here the recent confidence loss of uh, graduates this year as well. As well Any other announcements for the good body? All right, well, let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship the day and to stand in our posture. Opening them in number 68, women in our God, uh, and men in our music, guys, four or five. Uh, verses one, two, three, and five.
What was that? Well, I asked Becky Eagle to come to church today, but she wouldn't. Well, did you ask her why not?
and they sacrifice their wants and needs for the wants and needs of the children. I'm the uh, I'm the brother, so my voice is not getting good. In almost all cultures, mothers are respected and revered. In our Hindu prayers, we pray to God as you are my mother and also as you are my father. So mothers are respected that way. And we all have personal, unforgivable memories of our own mother. Personally, the one I vividly remember is before I flew from Bombay, India to the United States 55 years ago. I'm translating this in English because my mother talked to me in my mother tongue. She doesn't know a word of English. She reminded me a meaningful life is being weird. Being humble, being able to share ourselves and touch the lives of others. She told me never forget our tradition, our culture, and our faith in God. And I tried to fulfill those words. So this scripture is Acts 16, chapter 16. Verses 16 to 34. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God, who, pro who, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when, but when her owners saw but when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and fed them into the marketplace before the parties. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews. And are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in the bank attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. All of these instructions he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stars. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword 
and he was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him, and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejected that he had become a believer in God. So, week before last, I was uh, not feeling very well. I had you know, said it wasn't, I wasn't uh, sick for too long, but for a couple of days I had body aches and just didn't feel like doing much. Just to sit on the sofa and rest and I was watching some TV. And I never watched a lot of TV and I, I, I don't know if uh, people realize it, but I decided there's so many commercials now that I feel like we watch more commercials than we watch TV. So I got tired and I started rummaging through our cabinet. Something, you know, on the kind of recorded that I hadn't seen in a while. And I like musicals, and I hadn't seen My Fair Lady in a while. So I popped it in and I watched it. I don't know if anybody familiar with My Fair Lady. Um, for those who might not be, there's two principal characters, Henry Higgins and Eliza Doolittle. Henry Higgins is a finesse professor, and he wagers that he can transform a common lower class cockney accent flower girl, Glass Doodle, into a high class noble woman who can pass for a duchess at an embassy ball just by teaching her English diction, or high class English diction, and it. Now, you may or may not know, I knew this, but I never looked into it, but my favorite really is based upon a book called Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw. Now, I had never, you know, looked into this, and I thought, well, what is Pygmalion? So I Googled it. And I discovered a couple things that I thought were interesting. First of all, Pygmalion is actually uh, from Greek mythology. Pygmalion was the king who had this gift for sculpting. And he sculpted out of ivory his perfect image of a woman. And he loved it so much that he wished it was real. And the goddess Aphrodite granted him his wish and brought the statue of life. So it's a story of transformation. I don't know why my fair lady is based on the young. Um, because it's a transformation of the flower and world, the common flower and world, into what the world sees as the Duchess. But I also discovered that. This is also, it has a, it's called, a, it's a psychological phenomenon also called the big, the big gun effect. And it happens when an individual is influenced by others' expectations and behaviors toward them, and so, he, so that individual gets to take, take on that and be transformed into what the other person expects of them. So, for example, if I say you're lazy, and if, or if I see you as lazy, and I treat you as lazy, you're more likely to be lazy while you're lazy or not. And or if I say I'm a basketball coach, which I'm not, but if I were, and if I were a good one, if I saw you as a good basketball player, 
and I treated you like one, and I thought at the time like you were in, in you like you were one, you more than likely would wind up being the basketball player. So positive reinforcement can build self-confidence and possible uh, positive self-image. And think about Mother's Day, I think it's great, because I think that's what mothers do. You know? I remember, you know, Rob shared a story about his mom. I remember with my mother, uh, I'd come home from school with my report card. And, you know, at first it was a lot of seeds. And she would be so ecstatic, you know, it was like it was the most wonderful thing. And she made me feel so smart, you know. And I think because she felt that I was smart, I started to think of myself as being smart. And over the time, my C's became A's, and my, I mean B's, and my B's became A's, and by the time I was in high school, I was at the top of my class, and, and from then on in academia, it did pretty well. I don't know if I'm smart. I don't know if uh, I just well, your mother thinks so. <laughs> yeah, my mother thinks so. I, I, I don't know if I'm smart, maybe I'm smart enough to play the game. Well, my mother certainly thought I was smart, and I felt like I was smart. So, as I read today's scripture, you're probably thinking, why does this have to do with today's scripture? But I share it with you to just lead up to it, because as I was looking at today's scripture, I was really struggling with Paul's treatment of this slave girl, when I say treatment, uh, versus the, um, the jailer. And as I thought about it, I thought, well, you know, maybe this is an example of this Pygmalion effect. In fact, you know, Maybe the slave girl is an example of how society sees her versus the jailer as an example of how God sees the jailer. To just help you understand my unusual train of thought here, perhaps, <laughs> the slave girl, you know, she has the spirit of divination. And Paul and uh, Silas meet her, and she's been crying out to them. These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She's been going around saying this behind them. And after a few days of doing this, Paul is annoyed. And he orders the Spirit out of her, and in the name of Jesus, the Spirit departs. But I can understand. Why was Paul annoyed? I mean, what she was saying was absolutely true. To me, she said, more like John the Baptist, heralding. Uh, you know, the way of Jesus. And what was wrong with what she was saying? Why did it annoy him? I mean, the scripture never explains that. So I started to think about the, you know, casting out demons in the synoptic gospels. And there are several accounts of, you know, the demons being cast out there. But when you look at this account versus this account, it's, it looks totally different. And like those accounts, this account doesn't say that the demon, the, well, first of all, it doesn't say the spirit was a demon. It doesn't say it was evil. It doesn't say that the woman was healed. It doesn't, uh, Paul doesn't speak to the demon like Jesus often did. There were no bystanders around, around to witness this exorcism. <clears throat> no one seems to be led to Jesus as a result of Paul's uh, action here. And so, you know, what are we to make of it? All we know is the spirits left her, and then that's the last we hear of her. And then I was thinking about, well, you know, she made a lot of money for her masters, and now she's not able to tell fortunes anymore. So her masters have been economically hit in the pocketbooks. And so this slave girl probably was in a more precarious position than she had been before Paul cast out the demon. You know, if she wasn't making money for her masters, they might force her to make money in worse ways for them, maybe prostitution. Or maybe they would even consider selling her just to cut their losses. So then I had to wonder, well, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't say it, but maybe Paul did help her. Maybe he saw her as God sees her. Maybe he saw her as someone created in God's image, worthy of God's time, attention, love, and redemption. Maybe he took the time and saw it as an opportunity to share the good news with her, to introduce her to the Holy Spirit. Maybe he introduced her to Lydia, the, the seller of the purple fabrics. You know, in just a few, in a few verses before our reading today, Lydia uh, was converted to uh, accept Christ, he 
became a leader, a leader of the Christian community there in Philippi. But we don't know. We don't know if Paul did any of that. I'd like to think that he did. On the other hand, he might have seen her as the townspeople saw her, as someone not worthy much of anyone's time or attention. I wonder if he thought less highly of her because she was a fortune teller. Maybe that's why he just saw her as an annoyance and wanted her silence and out of the way. See, the spirit of divination that she had was also known as the Pythian spirit. I mean, the Greek actually uses that term. In some translations, if you look at it, will use that term. Pythia was the oracle at Delphi. So he probably he might have been concerned that the words, although the words that she was speaking were true, that people might become come to believe her words were coming from a false god, as opposed to trusting in the words that Paul was sharing uh, that he was speaking of the Lord. Again, we don't know. Paul is human. And I wouldn't fault him for thinking that it was a good idea just to silence her and send her away and distance himself from her. Maybe So we never know what happens there with that relationship between Paul and the slave girl. I really don't like those kinds of endings when they leave you with lots of questions. But maybe that's the point. And it reminds me how important it is when we reach out to others to make certain that we try to see them as God sees them. To see them as a child of God, someone to be seen and valued and loved the way God the great sculptor created them to be and loved them. Not as society tries to shape them to be. To see them with a the mother's eye. And then I thought about it, and I thought about the jailer, and I thought, that's a better example. I mean, I imagine the jailer was a good jailer, meaning that he did his job well, he took great pride in it, and certainly magistrates thought he did it well, and they told him to make certain Paul Silas were well secured, so he was very attentive. He put them in an inner prison, uh, inner cell, and he clamped their feet in stocks. And I think that's maybe why the jailer's first instinct was to draw a sword and to kill himself when he saw that the prison doors had been opened before Paul shouted at him to not harm himself because they were still there. And once again, our scripture is vague. It leaves room for lots of questions. All we know is that the jailer called for lights, ran in, fell down at Paul Silas's feet. Then he brought them outside and he asked them, what must I do to be saved? I mean, what happened in between? And why did Paul take the time to help him and not the slave girl? But I think perhaps that Paul and Silas wanted the jailer to know God's love. They wanted him to see that God loved him because God created him. They wanted him to know that he was valued by God because he was a child of God. They wanted him to see that his, his value wasn't dependent upon his success as a jailer. And I think that I'm not sure I could have done what Paul and Silas did. I mean, after being beaten and in prison, I probably would have taken the earthquake as a providential sign of God and made a beeline for the hills as soon as the doors were open. But by staying put, they demonstrated their deep care for the jailer's well-being. They put his welfare ahead of their own. It was a selfless act. In that moment, they saw the jailer as God saw him. As someone worthy of God's love, someone to be valued, someone worth saving. And it was such a radical and unpredictable response that I imagine the jailer just had to be flabbergasted. He had to know, I think he had to just know, he wanted to understand what was behind his odd behavior from them. And he probably thought, gosh. They're not running away. They think I'm worth saving. 
So he just had to ask that question. What must I do to be saved? I think Paul saw to see the jailer as God sees him. Again, someone's worthy of God's time and attention, love and redemption. And so they speak the word of the Lord to him and his household. And he and his household are baptized and become believers in God. And not only is the jailer physically saved from his own sword, but he's spiritually saved. By seeing the jailer as God sees him, by treating him as a child of God, Jailer comes to see himself as a child of God, worthy of life with and in Christ. So as I thought about these two examples, I started to think about the importance of checking myself. To ask myself, do I see the person in front of me, or the person beside me, or the person in the car next to me, as God sees them? Do I treat them as a child of God? Do I affirm them and value them as a child of God? Or do I look at them as society looks at them, as someone different, someone other, maybe somebody's flawed and less worthy of God's time, attention, and love? Do I build them up or do I tear them down? Imagine how different our communities in the world would be we saw in our neighbor the child of God that God sees. If we love them the way God loves them, imagine the world would be a whole lot different. May our reading help us be more aware of the way we see them, the way we see and perceive those around us. I pray that God helps us to see as God sees, that God helps us to reimagine what God is doing around us, so that we might spot the opportunities to bring the word of the Lord to those who need it. And not just some, simply words, but also actions. Let us be mindful of how our perception of others influences our behaviors towards them and their self-image. Let us pray that God continues His transforming work on our hearts, so that we might see as God sees, so we might speak transforming words that God speaks, so that we might build up and not tear down the children of God. Amen. Now is the time in our service when we uh, lift up our joys and concerns. Are there any joys and concerns that lift up this morning? That's gone. See them, but I both. <laughs> She's up for joy. Congratulations. Are there joys and concerns to hold up this morning? I would, uh, I'll let you know um, we've been praying for my sister Lisa. Uh, thank you for her prayers. She's very grateful. She had her surgery last week. Um, that she's been waiting months to have. And good news, the tumor that they removed is not cancerous. So praise God. Um, so she was a couple days at the University of Maryland. She came home yesterday, if I got the days right. Um, and so she's recuperating at home for a couple weeks, and then she'll slowly be able to do other things and hopefully get back to work in, in about six weeks. So um, please continue to order her but Thank you for the prayers that you all have been lifting up for our Other joys and concerns? And let us, let us uh, pray for the church of the world and all those who are, who are in need. The prayer is responsive, so when you hear the words of the Lord, the response is responsive to our prayer. <coughs> Lord, we risk little and suffer even less to serve you. Prepared with what your first followers endure. Remind us of their sacrifice, dedication, and determination that the gospel will be spread and make us grateful that we are beneficiaries of your witness. Risen Lord, the Spirit today you and all powers submit to you, Lord. 
Teach us to use our gifts for good and not for dishonest gain. Lead us to focus our efforts on behalf of those in need instead of exploiting others for our own benefit. May honesty, integrity, and love prevail over greed and manipulation. Prison Lord. Hear our prayer. On this Mother's Day, we celebrate our earthly mothers and all those who show a mother's love and care. Remind us of those who have lost or have never known their mothers, those who are in conflict or estranged from them, and those who desire children but struggle too, but cannot have them. Make us all families to one another, looking not to our own interests but to the interests of others. Risen Lord. Yeah. Lord, your resurrection is set up to all who despair of feeling whole again. Strengthen all who are in recovery and re- rehabilitation for ongoing treatment for chronic illness. And show them what hope looks like in the face of Christ. We especially lift up and hold in prayer those that we named aloud this morning, and those that we hold silently in our hearts. Pray for Lisa, and Maria, and Susan, and Carol, for Joanne, and Brandon, and Rebecca, for Anne, and for God, for Danny, for Betty. Lord, we also give you thanks, give you thanks for healing doctors, nurses, and those who care, those who are uh, in need of healing. We pray for our schools and our recent graduates. And we pray that you bless their journey as they move forward in this next stage of health their lives. Risen Lord, hear our prayer. Sometimes we feel unworthy to stand in the company of such great sufferers for the faith. Remind us that they, like us, were imperfect, yet empowered by your spirit. Gladden our hearts with the power we have through you. Risen Lord. Hear our prayer. Gather these and all the prayers of this community together into your loving arms, Lord, through the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now let's confess our sins before God and one another. I invite you this time to join in our prayer of confession found in the bulletin. Forgiving God, we spend so much of our time doubting you, doubting ourselves, failing to place our trust in you. Our lack of faith causes us to stumble, and when we fall, we fall apart. Forgive us our sin and lift us so that we can rise to the challenge of carrying our own mission. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God is merciful and just. God offers forgiveness for all who ask it. Receive now the entire forgiveness of all your sins and walk with the power of the Holy Spirit for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. This time I invite you to turn to your neighbor and exchange signs of peace and reconciliation.
offerings before you, Lord God. We ask that you bless them and use them for your glory, even when we do not see the end of our efforts. We know that you serve as the God of each of our hearts and transform our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.
we for our many are one uh, are one body if we partake of the one loaf. Bread that we break to share in the body of Christ. The blood, I mean the cup of which we give thanks is the sharing of the blood of Christ. table has been set. It's the Lord's table. It's not our table. And so all, all children, all the children of God are invited to God's table. The table is set. Come as you feel called to come.
give you thanks for allowing us to share this feast as your family to be fed with the bread of heaven. Give us grace that we all may grow in love, glorifying you in all things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This time I invite you to stand our posture for our closing hymn, hymn number 363, and it be that I should gain. We're only going to sing one verse, just sing the final verse, and then I invite you to stay as we honor our mothers.
girls discussing whether they wanted to be mothers or not. And one of them said, yeah, I don't think I want to be a mother. And uh, the other one said, well, why is that? She said, well, I think the download time is nine months. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Okay.